Well, good morning. Welcome to our equipping hour. Um, thankful that we we get some time this morning. We get to spend some time in the Psalms this morning, Psalm 90 in particular. Uh, but just as way of intro, it's, it's interesting. I just finished uh, my fourth semester of TES, and uh, it's summer break. Finally, this was my first week of summer break, and I got, I confess, I was a bit like a, uh, I felt a little bit like a junior hire who had been in school all year and had the finish line of summer and um, <laughs> was, was looking at that finish line with all the starry-eyed uh, wonders of what summer is to a junior hire, um, who looks ahead and with visions of just the best summer days with no classroom time, no study, um, only the best stuff, right? Uh, of course, it only took a little bit of time, and it's a little funny to realize that actually um, my childhood elation catches up with my life to realize that at my age, uh, actually, I've been looking forward to things that are studying and books that I've been wanting to read and work that I've been wanting to do. Um, much of the same things that I've been doing while I'm in TES, uh, this summer, and I get to because I get to, not because I have to. Um, and that's, that's exciting. That's a blessing to be able to know that that's what I get to do all the time now. But it does bring up an interesting question, um, seemingly a very subjective question. What does a good day look like? Um, in, in fact, if you were imagining just the best day ever or just a good day, what, what's in it? What do you see? What do you plan in your head? Here's, an, here's a more probing question, maybe. What are your criteria for choosing what makes a good day? Uh, in fact, let's just poke at this a little bit more. Th this kind of picks at the question of what does a well-lived life look like? Um, what does it mean to live life to the fullest? I think that brings images, different images to different people, doesn't it? to live life to the fullest. Have we considered that maybe our criteria for what makes a good day might be centered around our own favorite personal pleasures and comforts? Um, have we considered that maybe we don't have the wisdom that we need inherently to know what a good day is lived like and what the criteria is that we need for that? Uh, to make those decisions. This morning, um, we get to look at Psalm 90 together. The question that we're trying to answer, even here, burns at the heart of this psalm. It turns out that we tend to have a terrible frame of reference for even asking this question, and we lack the wisdom to answer it. This wisdom is wisdom that Moses knew. Uh, Moses knew that the people of God needed to know this wisdom as well. And this is wisdom we desperately need, and we get to turn to the Word of God to learn. So before we open God's Word together and turn to Psalm 90, um, let me pray, and we'll ask the Lord for His help. Lord, in Your loving kindness, we ask You to teach us in this time together. Teach us wisdom that comes from You uh, to us in Your Word. Help us to fix our attention on you and your character in such a way that our vision of you is more clear and more vivid, that our vision of ourselves and our need for you is, is more honest, more accurate. We ask that your spirit would work to quicken our hearts to your truth, awakening us to the significance of what you have to say here for us today, its value, its gravity. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 90 and follow along with me as I read. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight 
are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they're like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all your days, all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. This is a psalm that I've been familiar with for a long time. And in fact, there are some, some of my favorite quotables are in this psalm. And yet, even in those quotables, I, I tend to miss the gravity of what happens here. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to look at it in its entirety this morning. There's a lot in here. Could, could take a lot of time to go through the individual pieces. But let's look at the whole. From a background perspective... Um, we see, even in the, the, the subscript in our, our English Bibles, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. That's actually the first line of the psalm in the Hebrew. And so we know it's inspired. It's important for us to realize. But this is about the, uh, the extent of the context that we're given for the circumstance here. The psalmist Moses does not give us the actual particular time or situation that's happening here. But that doesn't reduce the message here. And in fact, what that tells us is that he's probably not wanting it to be so tied to that, that it couldn't be useful to God's people throughout many situations. I think the commentaries are, are somewhat um, in argument about which situation uh, he may be referring to in this. It could be the post-Babylonian exile. It could be the 40 years in the desert. I think Actually, as, as we look at this, it's helpful to remember one of these circumstances that God's people were in, where they were uh, in a season of discipline from the Lord, and then apply it this way so that we can see the timeless truth in it. Um, in fact, I think it's helpful for us to quickly recap. I'll, I'll recap the story. I, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe that this is um, maybe speaking directly to the time after the 40 years in the wilderness. And so to recap that, um, let's just review what we know about a circumstance. We can apply that here. God had miraculously delivered his people from Egypt and promised them a land of their own. And when they arrived at the promised land, the Lord instructed them to send in spies. We're familiar with this. And they send these spies in. And all but two of them come back um, uh, with this frightening report. Two of them had faith. They said, yep, this is a great land. And there are some pretty intimidating people in it. <laughs> um, and, and the others were spreading fear that overcame their fear of the Lord. It became greater, the fear of these people, and they, they didn't want to obey. Doubt grew among the people. They began to cry and grumble in their hearts. Uh, no need to turn there right now, but just, just to bring into clarity, I'm going to read a couple of verses from Numbers 11 uh, telling this story um, so that we can be familiar with the interaction between the people Moses and God, and have that nice and clear in our minds as we apply this. Um, in Numbers 14, let's just start in verse 2 and just read a few of these. It says, All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, 
Or would that we had died in this wilderness? And then verse 11, the Lord says to Moses, how long will these people spurn me? And how long will they not believe me? Despite the signs that I had performed in their midst. Down in 26, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. And then just in the last part here, verse 34, according to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day that you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. I, the Lord, have spoken, surely this I will do, and this evil congregation um, who are gathered together against me, in the wilderness they shall be destroyed, and there they will die. And that's exactly what happens. In that season, God's people experienced this judgment for 40 years, a particular season of discipline. Moses experienced all this with them. Being the man of God who spoke with God personally and knew God personally, he interceded for the people to God. He watched the Lord follow through with the punishment of his people, thousands dying over the years. And in the midst of a circumstance like that, Moses, the man of God, prays. And, and we have that to look at. Psalm 90 draws us to meditate on God and his character so that we would learn to live each day wisely before him and to trust in his loving kindness, to live in his favor and his goodness. So this morning, as we work through nine, Psalm 90 together, we will be led by the prayer of Moses, the man of God, to consider and meditate on four attributes of God's character that teach us to live each day wisely. Four attributes of God's character that teach us to live wisely. If you can put that slide up there, we'll go ahead and start through the outline. So Moses opens his prayer by acknowledging and worshiping God for an attribute of his character that sets the context, it sets the scope, the perspective that we need to even start considering wisdom and how to live. And that is God's eternality. Just look at verse 1 with me. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. These two verses show us God's eternality. It's interesting. Verse 1, um, it's actually a sweet for a... For a people that don't have a place to call their own, for them to say, look, for all generations, you have been our dwelling place. That's significant. It's not just since the beginning of God's people, since the beginning of time. It's in this time when we're wandering in the desert, we acknowledge, O oh Lord, you are our dwelling place now and you always have been. You're where we put our hope. This is where, where we hang our hat. It's not even a building or a tabernacle. Um... So that talks about the scope of his care for these people and his confidence in, in the dwelling place for them. And then, not only did God exist for all generations of God's people, but God existed before the mountains, before the earth, and all in it. God existed before anything existed. Look at that. And then he backs up even further. Not only was God around before creation, the oldest part of creation they could look at, but God was present even before time began. He has always been. From everlasting to everlasting. He is God. He is eternal. Do you notice the natural shift? I don't know about you, but there's a natural shift that happens in our own thinking, our own perspective, if we are in the midst of considering life, our own life, and then we stop to consider the limitlessness, the eternality of God just to consider this stunning attribute of God causes us to step out of thinking in our own terms of life and into God's terms. Moses, who's familiar with God, 
knows how needful this is for us mortals just in order to think rightly about our lives. We need the scope of our questions, the scope of our reasoning, the scope of our thinking to be the scope of God, which is in scope of eternity. So it's helpful and even necessary for us to set our minds on eternity, on, on God's scope of life. Otherwise, don't you feel your own tendency to start thinking in our own just little bubble, our own little lifetime? Um, our immediate era, we'd be man-centered and we'd have the paltry perspective of a man, uh, which can't bear the questions that we must ask to grow, to ask about life and to consider that. So now from this perspective, we, we read on to hear Moses contrast this attribute of his eternality with with the brevity of our lives. Um, and he directs us to dwell on a second attribute of God's character in this psalm, which is God's sovereignty over man's lifespan. Uh, we'll just say God's sovereignty on that second point over man's lifespan. Look at verse 3. You turn, back in, or you turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in, is, in your sight are like... Yesterday, when it passes by, or as a watch in the night, you have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew, and toward evening, it fades and withers away. So you see this. You have God's eternality, and now we're seeing his sovereignty over the lifespan of man. And it's in contrast to his vast eternality, we, we get to see that man is definitely transitory, not eternal. Um, and, and more than just transitory, it's brief. We're a, we're a breath in light of God's eternality. But notice the cause of man's brevity, according to these verses. It is by God's authority, by God's sovereignty, that the lives of men end, and even when each life ends. None of the descriptive uh, language here gives us any impression that it just happens by accident. It's actually purposely God's hand. You turn man back into dust. Look at that. Dust is a familiar term, by the way, um, used by God to describe his creation and his sovereignty over it, hearkening back to Genesis 3.19. When God said to Adam after the fall, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Um, you know, there, there's similar analogies. Um, I actually haven't uh, made it through Hebrew enough. I'll have to ask my companions to know this. But there are two words used here. The Hebrew word for dust, this one is actually one that gets pulverized into dust, which is a little bit different than Genesis 19. That's just, this is some dust. You were made from it, or sorry, Genesis 3. And then you're, you'll return back to that. This one is you'll return back to dust, but you're by hand made back into that that's an interesting thing to note. Um, so who's doing the action here? God. It's God's hand. Moses continues using imagery to demonstrate how fleeting man is. Look at verse 4. A life is like yesterday went by, or a night watch. That's like four hours. A lifetime is a brief period in time of maybe the view of all history. A lifetime is even more brief in view of all eternity, which is why that scope is so important for us to keep in mind. And then verse 5, God swept them away like a flood. You know what a flood does? It sweeps many away, swiftly, all at once. That's what it looks like. And that's by God's sovereignty that this is happening. And he's acknowledging that. Verse, the end of verse 5 and verse 6, grass flourishes briefly, then fades. This is a particular <laughs> uh, analogy, a, a poignant analogy for those dwelling in the wilderness, which is quite desert-like. We, we can relate, right? Look, in these arid regions, there were seasons where the coolness of the beginning of the day um, brings a morning dew and some coolness that sometimes encourages plants to sprout new growth or display new flowers. And I'm sure Moses had many times where he, he uh, appreciated the beauty of a new growth in, in, the, in the morning. But then as the sun begins its blazing arc across the sky uh, in an afternoon, every new tender shoot is scorched. It withers, it dies, it's gone. Such growth won't get a chance to grow maybe until a season changes a bit or until some clouds come. And then they can be allowed to establish, but not now. Not in that season. In the heat, they sprout, they display life for a brief few hours in the morning, and then they're scorched and they die. The imagery is clear. Our lives are brief. And God is the one who ends the lives of men 
He is sovereign over the brevity of our lives. Look, this, is a, this meditation of Moses is intended to be both worshipful and sobering, right? It's intentionally a heavy thought. It causes us to come face to face with the fact that God is the one who is in control as to whether I live today, whether my life is short or long. He's not, he's not passive in this. He's the one who decrees life and death, and I am a breath by his decree. That's an interesting meditation that Moses is bringing us to and saying, dwell on this. So in case I've begun to think that I'm some sort of authority about life, uh, in case I'm allowed my own, I've allowed my own thoughts and desires about life to dictate what matters and uh, what I should be doing in my life or in a day, the words of Moses in this psalm direct me to understand and dwell on the real uh, reality that God is sovereign over all of life, and I need to sit in awe of this, and I'm rightly, if I'm going to rightly consider my own life. So, so far, Moses has directed our attention to dwell on God's character and his eternality, and in God's sovereignty over our brief, transient lives. So next, in verses 7 through 11, Moses explains the cause of why, in God's sovereignty, he has made life's man to be, er, uh, man's life to be so brief. Look at verse 7. And we be see, beginning to see God's severity against sin. God's severity against sin. 7 through 12. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You've placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Actually, I'll, I'll just pause right there. So God's anger and wrath are consuming and dis dismaying them. Why? Well, because their sins are before God. And God's response to sin is severe. Even their quiet inward sins of their heart, we've, we've read about that. It's their grumbling. They don't even have to say it out loud, but the, the heart that just grumbles against God was one of the things that the Israelites were most disciplined for. Certainly the reason why they're in the situation that we read about in Numbers 11 but he exposes their sin, placing them in the light of his presence. And do you know what happens to sin in God's presence? It incites his rightful anger, the fury of God. Look at verse 7, the, the language there, anger, wrath. Verse 9, fury. And notice Moses dwells on these. He doesn't try to hide the sin. He doesn't try to explain it away. But God, let me explain why we were there. He actually brings it front and center the way that he sees God see it and makes the, he's praying. This is a psalm written down so that the people would rehearse it, that they would see it regularly. He puts it right out in front. Moses also doesn't try to ignore the, or distract from the fact that God is severe against sin. Again, he brings them face to face with it. There's an important purpose for this, a redemptive purpose for this. Moses knows it's human nature to want to ignore our sin and underplay God's severity against sin, so he, um, he knows it's uncomfortable, and he brings it there. This, these realities ought to be strong motivation for repentance and walking rightly with their God. To allow them to stick their head in the sand and ignore it would allow them to continue to live as they have been for 40 years. This is good medicine for an apathetic, faithless heart and the people were stuck in that. So in prayer, he leads the people to dwell on it as motivation. It's a, it's a meditation that should reorient their hearts. God has exposed your sin and placed it before himself in the light. God's severity against sin is real, and you're feeling it. Let's just be honest about that. Christian, these, these realities are still true about God. And they're to shape our own view of sin and our relationship with our God. We must see the way that God sees our sin. And we must acknowledge that it incites the righteous, holy anger of God, which is severe. The meditation here is instructive to us, isn't it? So Moses continues in verse 9, highlighting the, uh, the oh-so-practical and real result of God's severity against sin. They're all able to see and sense and, and feel it. Verse 9, For all our days have declined in your fury. 
We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. But their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone, and we fly away. Moses says their days have declined in God's fury. It's, it's, they've declined in two different ways. Seems that their days have declined um, in number. Uh, their lifespan is short. They, they feel the brevity of man's life because of God's severity against sin. Um, and it's also declined in purpose and satisfaction. Their years finish like a sigh. And even if they have a strong life, at best, all they have to show for it at the end of their life is labor and sorrow. So Moses said, because of God's severity against sin, life is brief, life is difficult, and it's unsatisfying. It's important to realize that what Moses is saying here is, is, is true always. Uh, it's, it's not just when God's people were in a particular season of discipline for their sin. Again, looking back to Genesis 3, where the curse occurs and, and, and they're recounting that, uh, where God is speaking to Adam after he had sin, explaining the curse of the fall. He says this, again, Genesis 3.19, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The curse um, which affects all the human race as the result of God's severity against sin, making life difficult for even just eating bread, leading to the decline of our lives and our death, physical death. And in Psalm 90, Moses finds it important to dwell on this reality. The life of any person under the curse of sin is brief, difficult, and ends like a sigh with nothing to show for it but labor and sorrow. On its own, on his own, this is the condition and the plight of every sinful man. That's what the curse is about. And it's because of his severity against sin. So that is the bad news, all right, clearly. But here's what's important to understand. Contrary to what you may hear out there, some cynical people say where they just say, Psst, life is just hard and you die. You ever heard anybody say that? They say it like that's just the way it is. Well, it is true. But look, we have God's word to explain the fact that this is, that is the way life is because God is sovereign over lives and he's severe against sin. God has made it so. It's not happenstance. Moses knew this universal condition to be true for all men. He looks around and seeing the people living out a vivid manifestation of this reality in the season of discipline and he doesn't want them to miss the clarity that this discipline is intended to bring. This isn't just because life is hard, it's because of sin. And I get to share the spoiler. Um, Moses also knew the good news, and it gave him hope. Moses knows that God has offered a way for sinful men to receive grace and be made righteous before him and to walk not as enemies of God, but in fellowship with him, close to him, in his favor, in his loving kindness that we'll see, but without judgment. And this can only be found in God, and thankfully Moses will lead us to that. He'll bring us to that in a moment. But outside of receiving grace from God, his word is clear. The reality of life for all people, uh, because of uh, sin, is, is God's severity, and the curse is on us. Life is hard, then we die, and then comes judgment, as Hebrews tells us. Judgment from a God who is severe against sin. So right now in this psalm, Moses looks at these people who are not living in the grace and goodness of God, but are under his discipline. And the people are not turning to God and they're not budging from their, their difficult, hopeless lives. And meditating on these realities naturally lands in, in a heavy lament. This, this psalm has elements of both, as far as a genre goes, it has elements of both lament and wisdom. And he brings the lament so that you'll listen to the wisdom. So as it should, um, it lands us in that. And, and this is why Moses purposely directs the hearts and the minds of the people to dwell here. 
This is why it's been written down for us and for us to meditate on these realities of God's character and our position before him. Rightly understood, lead to a real heaviness and burden for any who are living in opposition to God and his will. That's what it's meant to do. So Moses has brought us to this precipice, and in the depths of this lament, he responds by crying out in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Landing squarely on the crisis of this problem, he exclaims, Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? The question's rhetorical. (laughs) Who fears the Lord as they should? He looks around and and sees nobody is seeking to, to know the Lord that way. Nobody fears the Lord as they should, which is why they're not living as they should. When a person really considers the depths of God's character, his eternality, his sovereignty, his severity, Who really comprehends the magnitude of the severity of God and has the reverence of God that he's due due in a way that matches reality? He's asking, who seeks to know him? Who seeks to grapple as they should? You know, this this term throughout Scripture, just as an aside, this term, the fear of the Lord, uh, is an important concept throughout all of Scripture. If you're reading a book, uh, not Scripture, and you come across the turn, like, fear grip them, that doesn't sound like a good thing to come upon someone, does it? But in Scripture, the fear of the Lord is the result of a right acknowledgement, a right understanding of who God is. And the fear of the Lord was given to God's people to be the source of every blessing that came from God. God is the source of all good things. He's the giver of all good things. It requires the fear of the Lord. Just, just listen to a couple of passages. You're probably familiar with some of these, so I'll just read them that talk about the fear of the Lord. Back in Deuteronomy 6, 1 and, uh, verse 1 and 2, I love this passage, but listen to how the fear of the Lord is talked about. Now, this is the commandment, the statues and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may teach them in the land to which you are going to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and all his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. The fear of the Lord was like the source of that. It was given to them. And it was, by the way, parenting, good parenting that passes that on from down and down. And he says, be faithful with that. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Psalm 85, 9, surely his salvation is near those who fear him. Psalm 25, 12 through 14, a Psalm of David, who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. So even just in these passages, it's evident that the fear of the Lord is the source of all blessing. The beginning of wisdom leads to salvation, prolongs life, brings instruction, prosperity, invitation to know the secrets and promises of God intended to protect you from sin and evil. Without the fear of the Lord, such goodness from God cannot be found. So here in Psalm 90, the meditation Moses leads us in and and works to direct us to, he directs us to the all-important question. Do you fear God as you should? Consider with me for a moment how hopeless this situation would seem to Moses. Just add up what he's depicted of their bleak assessment of God's people at this point. These are people whose lives are a fleeting breath, who have been irreverent and sinful against a perfect and holy God who is eternal, sovereign over their lives and severe against their sin. These are people who are under punishment such that they are banished to the wilderness where they are sentenced to live difficult lives until they die. 
And to add to that, as a people, they don't seem to be learning the lesson that got them here. And if they don't change, God's wrath will just continue against the sin. Let's be honest. Most people would grow despondent <laughs> in this circumstance. I would. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't they likely lose hope completely, like all the people? They would think, what's the point? We're just here to live a hard life and die. Why try? Why work hard at all? Why try to please God at all? In fact, why not just spurn him all the more for doing this to us? I think we even heard some of that sentiment from the Israelites. I think we'd even hear that in our own hearts after 40 years of this. This would be the natural response of a human who is thinking in their own limited wisdom. This would be the perspective of a person who really doesn't know God well and does not seem to meditate on his character and who he is, trying to comprehend him and fear him. But this, Psalm 90, is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, the man that God chose to reveal himself to and to even speak plainly with face to face. Moses knew God well enough and dwelled on his character enough that he did not grow despondent. Rather, Moses has confident hope in God, and we can hear it in his response to his own question. Look down at verse 11, and just we'll read his expression one more, his cry in verse 11, and then his response. And we don't hear despondency, do we? He says in verse 11, Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Moses turns to God for help, asking himself, um, God himself, to teach them. He puts all his hope in God to be merciful to them, to help them get out of the pit that they're in. And from this point on, from verse 12 to the end of the psalm, Moses lays out his hope for the future of God's people by making requests to God based on the promises of God and the character of God because he knew God and he'd been meditating on it. In hope, he asked God to teach them. Teach them what? To number our days. Well, what, is, what does Moses mean by this? He's already pointed out the days are few. They're limited. So he says, Lord, given that they're limited... Teach us to live in light of that. Teach us not to be so cavalier as to think that there will always be a tomorrow and that we have plenty of time to get right. The, the term number here uh, is not just to enumerate them, to be able to count them. The word implies also to account for our days. How to measure them, how to evaluate them in content and value. You know, certainly a, a worldly person, I was referring to it earlier, and I might even include myself in, in this kind of fleshly tendency because I was evaluating myself this last week, a couple of weeks sitting in this, and, and you just can't help but sense our tendency. But, but a worldly person would measure the value of a day differently than a person who has been meditating on and growing in understanding of who God is and his character, what he values a natural man would measure the value of a day based on his personal preferences, his comforts, his own wisdom. But God is the creator of life. He's the giver of life, and he sovereignly ends it. It is his measure of a day that we should be concerned about, not ours. And since we can't actually fully comprehend the fullness of God's fury, and wrath against sin, we need to know all the more how to live a life that pleases God. I don't want to experience and understand the fullness of his fury. I can't as a mortal figure it out. I've, I've tried to think on it. It's frightening. So all the more, I want to know, how would God measure a good day so in verse 12, what's the goal of learning how to correctly value a day? The result of this, this teaching that they would gain would result in a heart of wisdom so that they could present a wise heart to God that honors him rather than a rebellious, grumbling, life-wasting heart that they have. They need a new heart. God does that. 
commentaries hopefully, uh, helpfully really point out that this term, this Hebrew term, wisdom, actually um, has a sense of gaining skill. So, in other words, Moses is asking that God himself would teach them how to live and that they would gain skill in living each day in a way that is productive and fruitful in ways that are valuable to God. Skillful in living each day to honor him. That's what he's asking for of, of God. We need to learn from this. <laughs> I need to learn from this. When we truly recognize our sinfulness before the living God, we too should respond by asking God to teach us, show me how to live an excellent day, skillful in bringing you honor. Because I, I, don't, I don't even, I don't register with that. Like as a natural man, I don't even have, as I say, the, the indicators on my dashboard to know and read whether or not I'm doing that without him teaching me. Help us gain skill, learning to live each day wisely, that we would gain that skill in living in a way that honors him, in a way that is valuable to him. Now, here's an important question for us. After such a crisis of recognizing that the people are stuck in their wicked and faithless hearts here in Psalm 90 as we're progressing through it, they're seemingly stuck to continue to bring more wrath upon them. What causes this man uh, Moses to hope in God. I know I've already said it a few times, but I'm going to just keep drilling it into for my heart to hear it. What causes him to not give up and to turn to God and, and hope in him? What causes him to boldly ask, by the way, for the help <laughs> to the God whom the people are sinning against? Moses' heart is again driven by what he knows of God's character. Are we getting that idea yet? It's important for us to know God's character, know his reality. Moses knows and trusts in, another, in, the, in the, the fourth um, character quality of God. And, and it's actually not just a character quality. It's something that the Lord has. His loving kindness. Moses trusts in what he knows of God and his loving kindness. Just look at this next passage, just um, 13 through the end. Do return, O Lord. How long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us be glad according to the days that you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, Confirm the work of our hands. What a contrast of how Moses described the people's life in the text earlier from a difficult, empty, meaningless life to this rich life in joy, peace, purpose, productivity. And even in the people's current condition, Moses hopes for it and asks for it. It's, a, it's just a stark contrast that if you put the two up there, you can see that this is teaching us something about the realities of, of life with God and life without God. Life under the curse and life under his favor. And it's fascinating and wonderful to hear this man of God pray to God. It's bold, isn't it? It would almost seem audacious and demanding, but that's not it. Moses knew God. And Moses knew God's words, God's purposes, God's promises. And this is Moses speaking plainly to God, as he had learned to do about what he knows to be true, about God's character, about his promises, and about his love for his people. Look at verse 13. Do return, O Lord. How long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. Can I just point something out? Um, I'm actually reading from the NASB here, and if you've got an LSB, it probably says Yahweh. And the NASB, uh, the NASB, or in some of the other translations, this is actually in, in all caps to let us know that that word, the Hebrew word there, is not actually the title Lord. It's the proper name for the God of Israel, Yahweh. This is not just any Lord, but the God of Israel who made promises and keeps them for his servant. Yahweh is the, the covenant God, the promise-keeping God. For his people. And also, um, do you remember in, in, in when I read earlier in Romans four, or Numbers 14, 
Uh, when God used the same phrase when speaking to Moses, he says, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe me in me despite all the signs I have performed in their midst? And now Moses is asking, how long, O Yahweh, my God? By the way, it's not like the impatient child asking from the back of the seat of the car on vacation, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, this is, this is rather... Moses remembering the words of God and waiting on what he will do to deliver his people because he said he would. How long? It's faith. Then he calls to Yahweh's loving kindness. Look at verse 14. Oh, satisfy us. He expects to be satisfied. You go from a life that's empty and meaningless and just ends in a sigh and has nothing but labor and sorrow to satisfaction. He says, Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. This word, loving kindness, it's the Hebrew word chesed. It's not just love. It's a special kind of love. A special kind of love that God, that Yahweh has for his people. It's a covenant love. It is a loyal, committed, sacrificial devotion to his people that only his people will know. It's full of mercy and goodness. And this is what he has placed on his people because he chose them. That's why they receive this loving kindness. They have access to a kind of love that is so devoted that even in the midst of all this, Moses can hope on it because he knows God's character. <laughs> That's how he knows God. So Moses calls on Yahweh's loving kindness, his hesed, his hesed, knowing and trusting in his character to keep the covenant love, this covenant love with his people. And it's in this loving kindness that God's people have access to all the mercy and goodness that, that, that Yahweh satisfies the soul with. And Moses knows how satisfying this loving kindness is to be loved by Yahweh like this, to be in his favor. This is why it transforms. It transforms emptiness to satisfaction, despair into singing. That's why he's asking for it here. And Yahweh's loving kindness for his people, life is transformed and he's looking forward to that. His hope and his faith in Yahweh continues. Look at verse 15. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Again, here's Moses recounting words he's heard God say to him, principles of how this works, and he's, he's asking for it in return. Remember in Numbers uh, 14, 34, when he says, when God had said to Moses, according to the number of days which you have spied out the land, you will know my opposition. Actually, the, the full verse, according to the numbers of days which you have spied out the land, 40 days for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. Now Moses recalls those words of God delivered in discipline and now waits on God's mercy to restore them according to his loving kindness to them. Verse 16. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Again, back in Numbers 14, God had said, and when he's interacting with Moses, had said this before. Look, I performed signs and works in their midst, and they still did not believe me, God said back then. That generation had seen God do mighty works that has now passed away. That whole generation has passed away. All the people that remembered that have passed away. You know what Moses yearns for? <laughs> Bring it back. I mean, let this next generation see how mighty you are, that they would just sing your praises. Satisfy us. Teach this generation to fear and honor you. Let us live in your loving kindness, Lord. Show them that they can know you as your people. It's one of the things that delights God to look at his people and say, you are my people, and his people to look at him and say, you are my God. That's not what's been happening. And Moses yearns for that, knows that that's the heart of the Lord in his loving kindness and asks for it. So, Boldly, he asked God to restore them to his favor. Let's look at verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Boldly, he asked God to restore them to his favor rather than remain in his displeasure, acknowledging that everything they do will not be productive in life. 
unless God makes it so. Look, without God's loving kindness, where God's people experience his mercy and his grace, his goodness in life, life is just hard, and then they die. Life expires like a sigh with no satisfaction. But in Yahweh's loving kindness, when you look at this passage and you look at what Moses has known and what, he's, what he can ask God for, look, he, he asked that Yahweh would return them and, and to them and restore them in verse 13, satisfy them in verse 14, that they would sing for joy and be glad in, in verse 14, that he would make them glad in, in verse 15, display his work before them and his majesty to this, their children, verse 16, that his favor would be upon them. Verse 17, that he would confirm the works of their hands because again, um, they, they love to be fruitful. They've not been for a long time. What a contrast. What a shepherd Moses is to direct the minds of the people of God to God, to, to view him more rightly, to see their sin before him, to see their hardship and to hope in God and to turn to him and live rightly with him. How about you? <laughs> I don't know about you, but sitting in this caused me to ask, what is my criteria for a good day? What's my criteria for a life lived to the fullest? You hop on Instagram or social media and you know, you see people talking about seizing life and they're like, I don't know, they've climbed to some top of some precipice mountain and they've got this great Instagram shot, you know, and they're living life. <laughs> that's, that's not what I get here. Or maybe there's a different definition for you. It's a vacation or time doing your favorite thing. But what is our criteria for a good day? Is our definition based on personal preferences, desires, pleasures, comforts? Does my definition of a good day factor in who God really is? His eternality, that scope, his sovereignty over our lives and lifespan, his severity against sin, and his loving kindness to hope in and look forward to. Do you fear the Lord as you should? It would shape how you live. Do you struggle to fear him as you should? Follow Moses' example. Dwell on who God really is. Work to see life in light of those realities. Fellowship with others about his character, including his severity, and the fear that he is due. Do you know his loving kindness? Do you trust in it and hope in it as Moses did? Do you know how a person can go from a life under the curse of the sin that's just short, brief, hard, and then you die, and then there's judgment? Do you know how to go from that to a life full of God's mercy, grace, goodness, with confidence in his favor in this life and into eternity? Look, in the time of Moses, for people to fear God and walk rightly with him required them to walk in faith that God had a solution for their sin. A sacrifice that would take the wrath that was destined for them because of their sin. Today, praise God, we live in a lifetime that where that mystery that they looked forward to in faith has been revealed, fulfilled, and recorded in Scripture. And it's available to us by faith as well. We have access to God's merciful loving kindness through his son. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the punishment for sin, and you cannot earn it. You cannot live life well enough to earn that. That's not how they did it. Moses' hope was not in them being righteous enough, was it? He was begging God to do this, give them a heart in, this, in the midst of their sin, and that's what Jesus offers too. While you were sinners, he died for you and offered this freely. If you understand the severity of God against sin and you wish to be free from your sin, Jesus has accomplished it. By turning from your sin and trusting in Jesus' death to pay for your sin, you will be forgiven and you can walk rightly with God and experience the loving kindness that he offers to his people with devotion. In his death, Jesus has made every provision for you to walk rightly with God and honor him in your life rather than living under the curse of sin. And, and Christian, if, if, if you find yourself struggling to walk as you should, consider just taking your devotional time and just using scripture to help you see God rightly and meditate, it on, med meditate on it like this. 
Pray on it more. Interact about it more. We all need it. We all need the stirring of it. And so I just want to encourage you, Moses has set a good model for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Psalm 90, from Moses' example to us and his testimony of your character to us. We praise you for your eternality, your sovereignty over our lives, even your severity against sin and for the loving kindness that you offer to sinners who turn to you and trust in you. Teach us, Lord, to see you rightly, to fear you as we should. Protect us from having dulled, hardened hearts that fail to grasp and dwell on who you really are. Help us to gaze on your character often as you have revealed yourself to us in Scripture with such clarity. What a grace to us. What a powerful antidote for self-centered, short-sighted living. Teach us, Lord, to account for our days. Teach us how to live each day skillfully to your honor and in fellowship with you. Help us to make that our goal in life, that we would present to you a heart of wisdom rather than a heart of selfish, short-sighted, temporal living. We praise you for your plan to rescue sinners from your own severe wrath against sin through the death of your precious son, Jesus. Help us to always hope in your loving kindness found in Christ and to grow in faith and trust in you. Help us to dwell on these realities as we need to, to stir each other in them and to live for your honor as we grow in them. We pray these in your son's name. Amen.